Mishko's hai. But Sat's day. We are shakke. We are strong. Welcome to Toronto Council Fire's anti-human and sex trafficking podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our podcast. My name is Farah Talat, and I'm the Embers Community Development Youth Coordinator here at Toronto Council Fire Native Culture Centre. Joining me are some incredible people who will guide us today as we begin to learn about and unravel the violence of human trafficking. Now, I'm sure that everybody is super excited to hear who we have with us today. Would you all like to introduce yourselves? Ani. Hi there, my name is Danny Meekwans. I am a youth that goes to Toronto Council Fire. Um, my spirit name is Black Bear. I am from Chiging First Nation um, and Wicomacon First Nation. And I will be the co MC for today. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Sharon Reddick. Uh, I'm the trauma support coordinator at Native Women's Resource Center. And uh, I work directly with uh, human traffic survivors and victims. Ani Bojo, Tejan Adishna Kaz. I am from Toronto, born and raised, but uh, my family is from AOK. I've been a part of Council Fire since I was very young, and now I'm working there with the Youth Wellness, as well as with the MMIWGT2S with Kaylee and Patty. And I'm very excited to meet you, Shannon, and hear your story. Thank you, everybody, for those introductions. It's so, so, so nice to have such intelligent and inspirational women to learn from today. And a big thank you to all of our listeners for joining us for our first ever session of We Are Strong a podcast where we discuss and reflect on the epidemic of human trafficking that continues to take place on Turtle Island. Now, before we start, Danny, my co-host, and I actually have a question for you, Tasia. Would you mind telling us and our listeners what exactly human trafficking actually is? Hi, everyone. So um, I'm just going to give you the definition of human trafficking. Um, But uh, human trafficking is the trade of, of humans for the purpose of forced labor, sexual slavery, commercial sexual exploitation, or for trafficking of others. They may provide a spouse in the context or a forced marriage or the extraction of organs or tissue, including surrogacy and oval removal. But yeah, that's the definition of trafficking. Thank you for sharing, Tasia. This is very important knowledge, and I am excited to get right into it. I couldn't agree more, Danny. Before we begin, the topics that we will be discussing are sensitive and they may be triggering to some people. Just so you know, we are all available afterwards to debrief if need be. So please don't hesitate to reach out if you feel triggered by anything that we discuss. Now, Sharon, as you mentioned, you're a trauma support coordinator and you often talk about the importance of bringing awareness to what you've called a silent crime against our youth, women, girls, children, and people. So what does your role as a trauma support coordinator actually entail? And have you found that there has been an overlap with your personal experiences and your role within community as a trauma support coordinator? Actually, yes, it does. uh, They both overlap my personal life and uh, the work that I do as a trauma support coordinator at Native Women's Resource Center. I, um, my work entails empowering human traffic survivors, victims, meeting them where they are for supports, letting them know where the resources are that's available. We support hotel stay if they're in danger and know where to go. We also provide traditional healing to try and start that journey to living a healthier and a better life. Usually with human trafficking, you know, it usually has a history of childhood trauma, child welfare, and uh, I meet them where they are. I let them know that I care and provide support services supportive counseling, emergency hygiene packages. You know, when our center was open, they could come and have showers and a warm meal and just someone to talk to that's not going to judge them. That's what my role is as a, a cookum and a trauma support coordinator. Um, a lot of the, you know, Aboriginal women and girls are at higher risk to be exploited because of the intergenerational trauma. And I see that on a daily basis. Even uh, it's even higher now with the pandemic because uh, there's nowhere to hide. You know, we can't find the traffickers because uh, they've gone underground with the pandemic. The most 
most of the history of our indigenous is sexual abuse, violence, neglect, uh, racial discrimination, either substance abuse, child welfare involvement, mental health, uh, you know, gang involvement, low level of education, limited employment opportunity, a lack of support services in the community. And with our Indigenous, they need cultural identity and cultural support that meets their needs. Because if you don't understand what this individual has been through coming from uh, intergenerational trauma, child welfare, foster care, abusive home, neglect, then you cannot sit and, and try to help this person through their trauma. I personally, where my work overlaps is with human trafficking is I work on a daily basis and I'm compassionate to help these young girls. I don't judge them. In my personal life, my daughter-in-law, her name's Ashley, you know, um, and gang violence, human trafficking, um, they, all, they go hand in hand because I'll tell you Ashley's story, but first I'm going to tell you about the gang violence and the gun violence here in our city. I lost my son to gun violence in 2014. He was murdered on the Danforth. And um, at that time, his girlfriend, Ashley, which I had not met at the time, she was uh, expecting a baby. They found out on Valentine's Day. And, um, and one month, four days later, my son was murdered. So Ashley went through her pregnancy without, without a father to her unborn child and not knowing any of the family. You know, Ashley, um, she then went to, uh, she was 22 years young, you know, having a baby on her own. She was at Massey Center, she could get her education, you know, trying to uh, do what is right. But the trauma of losing her child's father was something that she never, ever processed. But she did eventually, when the baby was, my granddaughter is three months old, she found us. She found us through Facebook, through prenatal group talking about her baby's father and never got to meet her baby because he was shot. They put it all together and um, I found her on Facebook. She brought the baby to me and told me, this is your son's daughter and uh, she's the light, love of my life. Ashley continued to go to school, but I started seeing change in Ashley. When my granddaughter was about 18 months old. I think, you know, Ashley was looking for love. She's young. She wants a boy. She, you know, uh, she was very vulnerable. I started seeing changes when instead of every second weekend taking my granddaughter, you know, she was asking me to take her every weekend. Um, you know, coming with new clothes, fancy, um, you know, Louis Vuitton purse, you know, red bottom shoes. And I have older daughters, so I'm looking at these and they're kind of like red flags. And but really got my attention is when she had um, my granddaughter's birthday day party at three years and um, she drove up in a BMW with a 22 year old looking guy with green on his uh, his dreadlocks and I thought you know Ashley's been acting strange where is this guy getting this car all these red flags started to come up and eventually he exploited her she went out to Vancouver to work she left my granddaughter with her mother myself we talked about it but her mother didn't quite understand what human trafficking was, doesn't know what working is. She didn't quite understand what was going on. But my main focus was not to make her understand. It was to protect my granddaughter at the time and let her know that her granddaughter is not in a health, it's not a healthy relationship if he takes her away from her only daughter that doesn't have a father as well. So as time went on, um, uh, Ashley started posting provocative pictures and uh, being in this field of human trafficking, I, you know, did a little research, asked questions from, you know, friends I know that work, have worked in the sex field. I reached out to them. I reached out to other workers and websites where girls, they do dates. And uh, I found Ashley. And, um, you know, I, I made that phone call to let her know, like, listen, you know, you have a beautiful daughter, like, what are you doing with your life? You know, she misses you. You haven't been around, you know, the time between her visits were getting longer and longer. So this is when the exploitation was at its peak and Ashley wasn't coming to see her daughter. 
I was continued to take my granddaughter every weekend, started noticing different behaviors in her. You know, she knew every Cardi B song out there, like, I don't dance, I make money moves. When you have a three-year-old singing them kind of songs, and in your mind, you're thinking something's going on with her mom, well, then I follow my gut instinct, and I knew something was going on. So I, I focused on the granddaughter and just you know, left myself open for Ashley to come to me whenever she needed someone to talk to as a cook as an auntie, you know, or just as, um, you know, her, her daughter's grandmother. But uh, Ashley went to work one day. It'll be a year on the 24th of this month. After being exploited in Vancouver, she came back and the beatings were unbearable. And uh, Ashley got a new boyfriend that accepted her as a sex worker, but was not exploiting her, but he was still spending her money. To me, that's still trafficking. He drove her to work on the 24th of February last year. And at 11.40, a 17-year-old boy came into Ashley's establishment with a machete. And because Ashley refused to meet his needs, he stabbed her, he killed her right in that moment. Uh, The owner tried to save Ashley. She lost a finger and she got the guy. He's now been charged with first degree murder, but his explanation was he killed her because he belonged to incel. That's a group of foreign men that don't like sex workers and are celibate, but not by choice, because nobody will have sex with them. There's a group of men out there that hate sex workers, hate women that look provocative to them. And because he's 17 years old, his name cannot be put on on in the news. So he's known as the incel killer. My Ashley is forgotten about as the mother beautiful mother that she was trying to be before she was exploited by this person that seen her vulnerability. My granddaughter, Avea, I look at her and she's full of trauma. She's six years old and lost both her parents to the street. That's why my passion, I'm so passionate about saving, helping, supporting, empowering anybody that's in the game, whether it's voluntarily you're doing it for your own needs and by choice, or you're coerced into doing it, you're exploited. I leave myself open that I will never judge and um, ask questions, you know, where have you been? Like when you start seeing change, like go by your gut instinct. Um, you know, my granddaughter, Vea, uh, the road ahead of her is not going to be easy, but as long as I have breath in me, that's one road she will not take. And I will bring attention to what's going on and not put value on money. I, you know, to make her childhood happy as possible, even though she's going through what she's going through to try and get attachment, let her know that she's loved. She doesn't have to look for love, you know, in all the wrong places. That's Ashley's story. And uh, now I have a granddaughter that has neither one of her parents. So um, that's Ashley's story. And uh, her anniversary is coming up. Uh, I ask you to just keep uh, myself, her mother, my granddaughter in your prayers and just know that creator, uh, creator made this happen for a reason. And uh, I never thought I could come back to work to do this work after Ashley was murdered, but uh, helping others is my healing and telling my story is part of my healing. And um, I will continue to reach out to anybody that, uh, that needs my services or needs my help. It's my Ashley story.
Thank you, Sharon. That was very touching. Oh, can we just take a break for a second? Holy, oh, that was a lot. Yeah, we could definitely take a moment. Yeah. Everybody, I know that it was a very, very heavy story, and thank you, Sharon, for sharing that. And um, we're also here to support you as well, you know, because yeah. we're really thankful that you're sharing your story. Take a moment, Danny, and uh, step really? back and uh, have a smudge. And I just wish, you know, like uh, working in this field as a trauma support coordinator, uh, how I'm so passionate and help any and everybody. But after this happened to Ashley, you know, I asked myself, why couldn't I have helped her? Like, I do this work. This is my granddaughter's mother. Why couldn't I have helped her or but I could, um, I could question myself over and over again, but the answers are in the creator's hands. And um, when I asked creator, creator said, I asked creator, why me? My daughter-in-law, first my son, my only son, my baby, and then my granddaughter's mother, like, and creator, response to me is because you're one of the strongest women I know and I put here to do this work it's your calling and uh, I've accepted that I thank you guys for listening and uh, you know um, actually in, in Islam I'll share this with you when somebody passes away, we say, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raja'un, which means we belong to God and to him we will um, return. You know, because yeah. you've mentioned before that, you know, um, your son and and your daughter-in-law are in the spirit world and they're safe now. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, uh, I just, you know, after trying to process like six years of some pretty heavy grief I realized you know your heart has a mind of its own but spirit they're gone physically but not spiritually the part that hurts is how and age and you know because we think look at the cycle of life as you know you don't bury your children you know you grow old you die your children bury you it's kind of messes with you when the cycle of life is messed up and you have to process the fact that they're only gone physically. And my son says, mom, I can do anything for you from the spirit world that I couldn't do for you here. So I go to my son, I go to Ashley when I need guidance, when I need help. I'm like, you know, sometimes I tell my son, it's like, God rest Ashley's soul. But like, you know, sometimes she get on my nerves and I'd be like, yo, like you pick some real fine baby mamas there, Sean. <laughs> and he'd be like, mom, I was in a hurry. Like, you know, Crater was calling me. I had to give you a baby before I left. And uh, I feel it's a gift from the creator. She's a gift from him. And also a gift from Ashley as well and I will keep Ashley's name alive as long as I have breath in me and I don't want you know she, her, her daughter's going to grow up and go google her mother's name and find out how because she's going to hear different stories you know and um, she's so smart she probably googled it now she's only six <laughs> I swear that kid is like so you know I don't want her mother's name to come up as, oh, a sex worker was killed by incel, by an incel. Like he gets the limelight. No, mm -hmm. it's a loving mother was exploited. Like put the yeah. limelight on her, give her the limelight. She did not choose to be exploited or she would have never met that incel. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't her, it would have been somebody else. It could have been anybody that opened that door because he just, Wanted to kill a sex worker. That's all he wanted to do. God forbid my granddaughter's mother 
just happened to be that one that day. But it could be any one of our community members, you know, at work, open the door innocently and get murdered just because of your cult beliefs. Very unfortunate. Yes. But it's out there and it happens and we have to know about it. And um, I never knew about incel until this happened to me. So we need to bring awareness to that as well. There's people out there that will kill you for just because. And, you know, um, those red flags, looking out for the signs and just letting them know that I'm open to, um, to be here for you anytime you need me. Thanks, guys. Chimi Gwetch, thank you for sharing. So given that you were so closely connected to the issue of human trafficking, what is some advice that you would give to a person who thinks someone they know or someone close to them is being trafficked? And who should a youth go talk to about an issue they're having if they think someone they know is being trafficked or trying to traffic them? As a youth, I mean, I don't know if they still call them guidance counselors in school. I mean, that's someone you could go to. You could go to, you know, a trusted auntie that's like a cool aunt that you know, um, support services in uh, your community, your elder, talk to your elder about it. I'm really concerned. I would just indirectly um, ask questions be aware of like red flags be non-judgmental ask questions take notice of the different patterns you know of them calling you back or texting you back if it's your home girl you were so close at one time and you know all of a sudden she's got a boyfriend and she doesn't text you anymore bam there's a red flag like and you go to her and it's like, girl, you've been changing. Like, what's going on with you? Are things cool with you and your guy? Like, you know, just be cool and be open with it. And, you know, and make them feel like if they ever want to tell you that, you know, they can come to you. And if any of the youth have any questions, are they open to um, contact you? Yes, absolutely. I have I, my email. I can uh, send my email out as trauma coordinator. Native Women's Resource Center, or you can call the center and just say, I want to speak to the trauma support coordinator. And there's only one, or if you even ask for Sharon, um, I, I will get back to you directly and ASAP. And that's another issue I find with human trafficking victims and survivors is the response is not fast enough. People make phone calls, they want help. If you wait a day, two days, three days, next week even, um, they've already forgotten about that bad date and that beating that the, the trafficker put on them. Uh, they've forgotten about it. So we would definitely need faster response. And I would say reach out to me because you reach out to me, I'm on the next call. I'm calling wherever I need to call to get you help. And um, you'll have my cell phone number for emergencies. Wow, thank you, Sharon, so much for sharing your story and also for sharing that information and your contact information, too. Um, and thank you also to our listeners for joining us today and for everybody who has joined us. And again, if you're feeling triggered by anything that was shared, please don't hesitate to reach out to Shannon. And um, any of us, um, I'm sure you can access our emails on Council Fire's website. And just remember to ground yourself any way that's good for grounding you, whether it's smudging or meditating or even just breathing in, putting down tobacco, if that's what helps you. And just make sure you're grounded and that you speak about these issues and you don't hold them in because it is okay to be uh, to talk about. Yes, you're so right, Danny. Thank you so much. So again, just to reiterate, Sharon's email is trauma coordinator at nwrct.ca. And feel free to reach out to me, Farah at embers-cdyc at councilfire.ca if you need any supports as well. Thank you everyone again for listening. I hope you all have a great day and please take care of yourselves. Thank you for listening to our first session of our podcast, We Are Strong. Bye everybody. Bye. Miigwech. <laughs>